Have you ever heard of the new, newest thing in Christianity today? It is called progressive Christianity. Now, it really isn't anything new. It's the same old devil's attack, just dressed up just a little differently. I saw this fellow on YouTube. Um, he was doing a video, and he's all dressed up fancy in a robe and everything, and, and he's got his little rag hanging down here and all of that stuff. And he says, I will understand Jesus using my own cultural symbols. And even if I get it wrong, he is still my Jesus. Now, I'm just going to let that sink in for a minute as I go here. That is just wrong in so many ways. He admits he doesn't really care if he gets it wrong because the most important thing is that he's doing what he wants to do and Jesus still belongs to him. He says he's my Jesus. He's, so he, he, it's like he's got personal ownership over Jesus. Even in our twisted society today sometimes, that wouldn't work in any other relationship. Try it out. You wouldn't say to any other person that I will interpret you any way that I want to, regardless of what you say, and if I get it wrong, you still belong to me. How, how does that work? This is disrespectful. It is not humility in any way, shape, or form. It is not faith in Jesus. It is narcissistic and abusive. It, it, it's so sinful and degrading, and it's exercising pride rather than humility. You cannot take Jesus on your terms. It has to be on his terms. More importantly, if you say he is my Jesus, you have not been listening or to or have heard his message. You are just using Jesus as a, and his popularity as a mouthpiece for your agenda and your message. The irony in all of this is when you say that, you're saying you don't really care about Jesus. You only care about yourself. That is idolatry in the worst sense because you are saying that Jesus is going to fit into what you want to do and what you want to believe. Jesus says many things contrary to what this fellow preached. If you will come and, and follow me, Jesus says, I will give you rest for your soul. Follow him, not him follow you. He, he says... Um, the one who loves me abides in his word. Whoever keeps his commandments is the one who loves him. Scripture says he bought us at a price. We don't have ownership of Jesus. He has ownership of us. That's the truth. Paul says in his introduction to the Roman letter that we are called to belong to Jesus, not Jesus belong to us. All of those things. And again, he says, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So it is exactly the opposite to what progressive Christianity is suggesting. He doesn't belong to us. We belong to him. Genesis 12 verse 3 is God's covenant with Abraham, where he says that through him and his seed, that is Jesus, all nations will be blessed. And then in Genesis 49 and 10, he says, the scepter will not pass from the line of Judah until he to whom it belongs has come. Well, who does the scepter belong to? It belongs to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, our King. In 2 Samuel 7, David has promised that God would raise up from his flesh and blood one that would reign eternally on the throne. And it talks about the virgin birth and his suffering and, and um, where he'd be born and, and different events that would take place. God is saying Jesus is coming. And now, did he ever come? Just as the scripture said he would, from his 
birth, to his ministry, to his trial by evil men, to his sacrifice, his burial, and ultimate resurrection. He fulfilled it all. I think it's Luke 24, 44 says, he fulfilled everything that was said about him in the, the, the Torah the, and, and the Psalms and, and the prophets. Everything. He fulfilled it all. And he established his eternal kingdom. That doesn't sound like someone that we would take ownership of, but it does sound like someone who would take us to be his people and belong to him. This morning we're going to look at who Jesus is, not so that we can make him our personal property, but that we can be blessed enough to become his personal property, his people, his beloved and we will do this by looking at who he is and what the different titles tell us about who he is. The first point we want to look at is the immortality of Jesus. The scripture teaches us that Jesus is the Son of God. In fact, that there are more witnesses and testimonies that Jesus is the Son of the living God than any judge or court or anyone else would ever need to ratify it as truth. There are many prophecies of the Son coming, and they were all fulfilled. God from heaven declared him to be his Son in Matthew 3 and 17 when he came up when John the Baptist baptized him. John the Baptist prepared the way, and when Jesus came, he declared, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He gave multiple, te there's been multiple testimonies to this fact. Jesus himself made the claim of being the Son of God. The demons he cast out witnessed that he was the Son of God. The demons did. Um, the, the scriptures testify to the fact that he is the Son of God, and, and his miraculous works, his mighty works, testify to that same thing. The healings, the calming of the water, the feeding of the 5,000, the, the water to wine, and the resurrections from the dead, and all of those things that Jesus did, all testify that he is the Son of God, that he was God in the flesh. And even the Roman guards at the crucifixion said, surely... This was the Son of God. Well, they should have corrected that. They should have said, this is the Son of God because he didn't go anywhere. He's still alive. But there's so much more we can add here, but there, there is no need. Jesus is the Son of God. And being the Son of God automatically makes him Lord. Now, Lord means someone who has power and authority over you, like a master or a ruler. In other words, when we are in Jesus, he is our ruling authority. And people look at this sometimes and they, they look at it negative, but it's a positive because he loves us. He wants what's best for us. To have a Lord that does that, you can't have anything better. In John 13 and 13, when Jesus had washed the disciples' feet, he sat down and, and after all of that, and he said to them, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. He never denied the fact that he is Lord. He said, I am Lord. Things that happened in Jesus' ministry and with his apostles demonstrates the fact, this fact to be true as well. At his birth, the wise men, when they found Jesus, they fell down and they worshipped him. Does man ever get worshipped? Well, I guess sometimes in the world they do, but they're not supposed to be. The apostles in the boat, when he calmed the sea, worshipped him and said, surely you are the Son of God. After his resurrection, they came to them and, and they fell down and they worshipped him. When Jesus came to Thomas and he said, give me that finger, here, put it in my hand. He said, give me your hand, stick it in my side. And believe, don't doubt. Thomas responded, my Lord and my God. If, if he isn't Lord, that would not fly. Jesus accepted worship from people because he was God in the flesh, because he is Lord. 
In Luke 6 and 46, Jesus is giving us a warning about that. He gives us a warning. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Think about that. We ought to be careful that we don't just say, Lord, Lord, and think we're going to get into heaven. That doesn't work that way. You actually have to demonstrate in your life that he's Lord and actually believe it in your heart. And then the last point about his immortality uh, is in regards to Jesus, is, is his, his ability to save us, to save us from our wretchedness. There's no mere man that can do that for us. No one can do that. You can't do it yourself for yourself. In Luke 10 and verse 10, after Jesus goes to Zacchaeus' house and after a conversation with him, he says that salvation has come to that house. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That was his mission. After Jesus' ascension, the apostles who carried forth the gospel of the kingdom spoke time and time again that Jesus is our Savior. Luke records that unto us a Savior is born, who is Christ the Lord. This he said, speaking of Jesus, of course, he's our Savior, he's our Lord. Paul wrote to the Philippians in chapter 3 and verse 20 of his letter to them, and he says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. Who here wants that body? I do. Amen. Come on. We all do, don't we? That's where our citizenship is. Where well, our citizenship's not here. And, and, and he's, we're waiting for him not to save us. We're already saved if we're immersed into him. But we're waiting for him to come so we can go home and be at home with him in glory. So again, there are a multitude of scriptures testifying that Jesus is our Savior. Now, have you ever heard of someone that is able to save someone else that the one they save becomes their boss? It doesn't work that way, does it? No, it doesn't, it doesn't go, doesn't fly. So the first and perhaps most important point we must remember in our relationship with Jesus is that he is immortal. He is God and was God in the flesh and we worship him and we obey him. And if we want to go do our own thing, he's not going to rubber stamp it. It's not going to work. The church sets the tone for society, not society for the church. And we've got to keep that straight. God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And we must remember that. The second point we want to look at this morning is Jesus, the mortal one. Jesus came to earth from the Father of lights in heaven. Philippians 2, 1 through 11 explains it very well how he took on the body of uh, uh, flesh like a man um, and, and completed his ministry. But John says it this way. He says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So whoever this word is, was part of creating us and everything that we see and that we don't see around us. Then John writes, that word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory as of the one and only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth, John 1.14. No one else has seen God. The only God who is at the Father's is at the Father's. He has made him known. So here is Jesus, the Word personified, the truth of God, the grace of God, and has dwelt among the people, at least at that time. And, and that could be something to wrap our minds around for sure. We've got to get our minds wrapped around that. But then in John 16, Jesus told the apostles that the Holy Spirit would reveal everything that he tells the Holy Spirit to reveal. 
And because what he's revealing through the Spirit to the apostles was what he received from the Father in heaven. So there you have it. Jesus is the Word of God. He is the Word that instructs, the Word that tells of God's grace, the good news of salvation. It is the Word that guides the hearts and the minds of people so that we can all spend eternity together with him in heaven. So he's the Word, but he's much more than that. Jesus was coming towards John the Baptist, and John immediately cried out, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He made this proclamation of Jesus in, on two different occasions. The Lamb of God here is in, re in reference to Jesus who became the perfect sacrificial Lamb for the sins of the world. The Hebrew writer teaching the Jewish Christians who struggled with giving up the law over having grace in Christ, he says this about Christ as the Lamb of God. When Christ came into this world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. In case you haven't connected the dots here, Jesus is the sacrificial lamb of God. He is the only one that could make us be who we are today right here, be followers, be disciples of Jesus Christ. He's the only one that could save us because he lived a pure life and it had to be a pure life sacrificed for the sins of the world. The peace that I want us to see this morning that Jesus gives us is not as the world gives us. Oh, sorry, I messed up here this minute. So Jesus is our lamb. He died for us. We didn't, like Paul said to the Corinthians, he said, I didn't die for you. Christ died for you. We didn't die for Christ. He died for us. The prophet Isaiah, looking into the future, speaks of Jesus saying, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9, 6. He goes on to say that of the increase of his government and of peace, there shall be no end. Imagine that. There will be no end to the increase of of his governing as people come turn their way back to the kingdom first in John 14 and 27 Jesus said to the apostles peace I leave you my peace I give to you Jesus came to give us peace the question we have to answer then is what kind of peace did Jesus come to give us because there's not peace like we look at peace in this world the peace that Jesus came to give us is not like the world because the peace he's giving us is with the Father in heaven. You see, when I'm a sinner and I have not, my sins are not paid for, I'm in conflict with God. I'm fighting God. I'm against God. And Jesus makes it possible to render that, that situation peaceful by cleansing us of our sins so we can be with the Father and be in a relationship with him. Paul says in Romans 5.1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The peace we have with God no long, is no longer living contrary to him, but living and walking with him, being cleansed of our sin. We no longer are at with God. We are not fighting God. We are loving God and being with him. So Jesus, the word of God, came and put on a mortal body to be the sacrificial lamb to pay for the, our debt of sin. And he died and he rose again and he's in eternity living. One of the many blessings of that sacrifice then is the peace that we can have with God. He's the Prince of Peace. 
Now, the third point I want us to look at about Jesus is that is the church and, and who he is to the church. When Jesus was in his mortal body, he also established a church. In Matthew 16 and 16, Peter answers Jesus' question and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus has a conversation with him. That was revealed to you by the Father in heaven and all of these things. But then he says, and you're Peter, and on this rock, or on that confession you gave, that I am the son of the living God, the Christ, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. You see, Jesus came and laid the foundation for his spiritual and sanctified church. And we get to be part of that. He then, being the founder and the builder of the church, it only stands to reason that he is the head of the church. Colossians 1.18 says, And he, Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. In everything he might be preeminent. Not just in what we choose him to be preeminent in, but in everything. The head of the body is vital to its survival, to its ability to go the right directions and to function properly and have the motor skills. In fact, the brain, and you might call it computer, of the body is what runs everything. Um, if you cut the head off your body, what's going to happen? You know what's going to happen. If you put, just try a guillotine if you want to find out. No, don't do that. Um, but the same is for the church. If you cut the head off, that's Jesus. What do you have? You have nothing except death. A dead church. The head of the body is so vital. So anything called church in this world where it isn't that where Jesus isn't the head is not the church that Jesus built. It's just that simple. It is not the church of which he is the head. Anything can be called church. I mean, you can call anything church because in the Greek, it's just assembly, congregation, a body of people. That's what church is. So you can call anything a church. But you can't call anything a church and say Jesus is the head of it. It has to be his church, his way. That being said, it is also scripturally true that Jesus is the spirit of the church and that he is the one who supplies the Holy Spirit to aid in the functioning and growth of the church. He told the apostles that he had to go back to the Father and they were upset and they didn't want him to go and he said, well, you know, he said, this is going to be a benefit for you, not, not a bad thing. Because if I go back, then I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And he's going to guide you into all truth. And he's going to strengthen you. And, and he's going to uh, help you in your prayers and your weaknesses. And, and all of these things. The Spirit's going to do all of these things for you. So this is a benefit. This Spirit, Peter tells us, we receive when we're immersed into Christ, Acts 2 and 38. And it was Paul later on in his letter to the Corinthian church who said to them, do you not know that you are God's temple and the spirit of God dwells in you? 1 Corinthians 3 and 16. We are admonished to strive to have unity in, of the spirit, to live and to do things by the spirit because we are all saved by that same spirit. We are all gifted by that same spirit and we all walk by that same spirit. If I'm not walking or living or being guided by or being saved by the spirit that Christ sent for the church, I cannot possibly make the claim that he's still my Jesus. It doesn't work. That is diabolically opposed to what we are taught by Christ and about Christ. And last but not least, by any means, we must understand and acknowledge that Jesus is the one and only giver 
of true life. Jesus is the life of the church. Not the other way around. I mean, you might think you're really good and you might think you're all that and, and, and the church needs you. And I've run into a lot of people that think that, man, the church won't survive without me. I'm here to do it for you. And I just look at him and say, no, thank you. My Lord is very capable and he will do it all. And he's fine with that. And I'm fine with that. He's the one. He is the life of the church. In the 11th chapter of John's Gospel, um, Jesus comes to where he, to to see his friend Lazarus. Lazarus has died. In fact, he stalled a little bit to put a little emphasis on what he was going to do with Lazarus. And so he arrives, and of course his apostles are reluctantly following him at this point. They're not anxiously following him because they're thinking, man, they just about stoned you last time you were there. Why are you going back there? We're all going to die. And but he arrives and he has a conversation with Martha. And Martha says, yes, Lord, I know. Uh, she wanted Lazarus right now, right in front of her. But she said, I know that he will be resurrected in the last day. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. Think about that. There's no better definition of the resurrection than that in all of scripture. He's saying, you're going to lose this body. It's going to die. But no big deal. I'm going to get you back up out of that grave. And you will live. We will live with him in eternity. One of my favorite passages, and I have a lot of them, but one of them is found in John 5 and 21. Jesus is talking to the Jews who wanted to kill him about his authority and that the Father gave him the authority the Father gave him and he says to them for as the Father raises the dead and gives them life so also the Son gives life to whom he will what does that make Jesus? God? Amen it makes him God so what we want to make note of here is that the church belongs to to Jesus. It's his church, not our church. It's his church. And he is the life and the spirit of the church. Typically, the one who gives the spirit, the one who gives life, is usually the one that is worshipped. Amen? Not the other way around. As I mentioned about 20 minutes ago, in my introduction, there are teachers coming out which are presented as being Christian, meaning that they are they're taking on the name Christian, um, and they're they're trying to do that to say it's of Christ. They are old teachings; they go all the way back to the garden and the devil in the garden. Solomon rightly said that there is nothing new under the sun. All you need to do is test it against the word of God. The new teaching is not new at all. It only means that it's dressed up to look different and hopefully the deception takes hold of some souls. But we've always been plagued with that in this world. To say you're going to do things the way you feel like doing them and if I'm wrong, oh well, he's still my Jesus is to say that our Lord Jesus, our, our, sorry, is to say that we are Lord of Jesus rather than him being our Lord. That is heresy in the likeness of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. This is being presented by those who profess to be Christian, though it is in, in name only. This, this pretty wrapping around their teaching is called progressive Christianity. If you don't understand that dressing, here's the truth of what they're saying. What they, what they want to happen is not for the church to be the standard or measure of society, but rather they want society to be the measure of Christianity. Now think about where this goes. The absolute, it has to be the absolute acceptance of all of man's desires over those of Jesus. 
practicing homosexuality is okay with God because they say so and they accept it. Suicide's okay because they accept that. That's okay. All of those things are okay. Pretty much any sin, maybe they'll eliminate, maybe they won't do murder, something like that. But that, that's what they're trying to tell us. So Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You can only come to the Father through me. They say, oh no, there's many ways to come to God. Because God loves everyone, and that's the truth. Well, it is true that God loves everyone, but he needs them to conform to his will. Otherwise, they don't love him back. And that is the problem. So, there aren't many ways. There's one way, Jesus said. But they're trying, this is what they want to incorporate. Jesus says, whoever hears my words and keeps them will have eternal life. Whoever obeys my commandments loves me and will have the reward. Jesus says, I am the light of life. I am the way of life. I am the truth of life. And I am life itself. There is not any other way. There is no other life. There is no other way to life or anything else. It is a package deal. And it is all centered in me. And to receive it, you must turn from your ways and be immersed into me and be raised to walk a new life. We cannot and never will be able to go and do things the way we want to do them and somehow switch it over to being in Christ and being received in heaven. It just doesn't work that way. We are called repeatedly to be doers of the word and not just hearers. That means we do not follow our ill-fated ways or desires and try to rectify them or out of ignorance and disobedience Say, Jesus will just accept me anyways. He's my Jesus. That doesn't work. God's thoughts are not our thoughts, and his ways are not our ways. It cannot be said any plainer. Do not be deceived. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. So let's do the will of the Father in heaven and not listen to that other rhetoric out there. If we can help you to know Jesus this morning, let us know how we can help you and encourage you so that you can be in Jesus, truly in Jesus, and not just be making a false claim. Now let's stand and sing. Jesus is